everybody. Uh, welcome back. You are here for class number two of Prototyping and Mechanical Engineering. I am uh, Will Fisher. You can see my name there on the screen. It'll show up on every single slide, so you won't forget who I am. I am a prototyping engineer. I am an American based out of Berlin, Germany, and I have more than a decade of mechanical engineering experience, plus also some like other stuff in intellectual property and business. And I'm co-founded a couple of companies and all sorts of stuff. I'm repping the, the home team here with the NASA t-shirt. I did my master's research at NASA, um, so I've got, I feel pretty validated in wearing that. Um, so uh, we'll dive right in then um, and uh, get on cooking because we had a lot to cover today. Uh, let's see. Um, so we're going to talk about materials today, and I, I'm going to start in with kind of a horror story of what goes wrong when mechanical engineers get materials Incorrect, and that is something that happened 35 years ago last week, which is the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. And the disaster was caused um, in part uh, because of a failure from an O-ring, and it went through a whole lot of reviews and this sort of stuff. Um, but the O-rings were not designed to operate at the temperature that they were operating at, and despite uh, the the hesitation on the part of uh, some of the manufacturers. Uh, they went ahead with the launch, and of course, uh, tragedy occurred. And so this is a really important thing to think about when it comes to choosing uh, your um, choosing your materials when you're doing uh, design. Um, so uh, this is not the only time when that happens. Sometimes it's just a big pain in the butt, maybe not dangerous. The Oakland Bay Bridge, uh, which is the bridge that connects San Francisco and Oakland in California, one of my possibly my favorite bridge. I'm biased because I lived in Oakland for many years. Um, but uh, the Oakland Bay Bridge, when it was under construction, they discovered part of the way through the construction uh, that the steel that they had ordered had uh, too high of a hydrogen content, which led to hydrogen embrittlement, and uh, that made the, the bolts fracture as they were starting to thread the nuts onto them. And these are huge, like, bridge-sized bolts, so totally crazy stuff. Um, so that's why materials are super important. Um, I also want to take a quick movie break uh, to enjoy how materials are commonly looked at in science. This is not, in fact, how it is in the real world. So... Impossible. I combine the crystals in a tungsten titanium matrix at super cool temperatures. And that's what did the trick. The applications for this are... What do you call this material? Well, its real name has 37 syllables. I call it unobtainium. So this is one of the classic unobtainium scenes, but let's have another one just for good measure because unobtainium is not a real material. It's a portmanteau of unobtainable and... Uh, this is why we're here. Uh, uh, anium. Because this little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. That's the only reason. It's what pays for the whole party. It's what pays for your science. Brendo? Now those savages are threatening our whole So anyway, you kind of get the idea here, um, and that is uh, that, uh, you know, the movies will often take a very interesting uh, approach to materials and engineering materials, and they often name things unobtainium, which I think is totally ludicrous. We will not be discussing any more unobtainium for the rest of the day, except as jokes. Um, so we'll move right along. Um, today's agenda, we already kind of covered why material selection is important. Um, it has a lot of ramifications. Um, for your design and, and how you build stuff. And in fact, the reason that I put this as class two is that uh, really it should be the start of your design is, okay, I want to build a thing. What do I make it out of? Before I even start designing, I want to know if I'm building out of plastic or metal. I mean, that is a fundamental and important question. Um, so we're going to cover some of those, <coughs> excuse me, cover some of those things uh, today and why you might choose one material over another is where we'll start. And then I'm going to do a deeper dive into specific materials themselves and what their real advantages and disadvantages are. So that will be, we'll start out with metals, uh, which is a field in itself. Actually, basically every slide, there are 63 slides in the slide deck. Every single one of them is an entire career in itself. Um, so we are moving as fast as fast can be. Um, and uh, just remember that there is a ton of science behind all of these things. After metals, we'll do plastics and polymers. We'll touch extremely briefly on ceramics and why they're used in an engineering context. Uh, we're not going to look into like uh, like pots and pans, but well, we'll look into pans. Um, and then we'll look at composites after that to finish this up. 
Um, and so that makes for what is uh, an extremely fast moving day. So let's not delay, let's hop right into it. Um, we're gonna take a look right now at material selection criteria. This is how you choose your materials. Material selection is not surprisingly extremely application specific. What works in one material does not work in another. Uh, you would never use gasoline to build a bridge uh, because gasoline is a liquid, right? Um, so that is true across the spectrum. And that's true even today, we're gonna focus entirely on solids. Uh, I'll look at liquids and gases in week four when we talk about fluids. But in terms of choosing your specific solids, there's still a huge variety. Um, and your application may require multiple materials. So for instance, um, steel by itself uh, is uh, good. It tends to buckle if compressed um, in long spans. And so concrete, on the other hand, tends to rupture in tension. So a lot of times you'll see concrete used with steel reinforcements to create a very strong, uh, a very strong material for a large scale thing. I'll talk a little bit more about that reinforcement uh, when we talk about concrete in the composite section. Um, it could also be that you want an extremely lightweight material uh, that's very strong, something like aluminum. The problem is you have electronic components going on it, and what you really don't want to do is put your nice fancy board directly on your piece of aluminum because you will short out and destroy your board. That's bad news, so you might use something for electrical insulation, heat shrink or, or coating of some sort. Um, you could do this for thermal insulation as well. We'll talk about those two things in a little bit more here in a second. At the end of the day, you will choose the best material for your project. Um, that's probably going to require some compromise. There is no material that does everything, and if there was, it would be so outrageously expensive, you would never be able to afford it. So um, we're going to consider a lot of things. Um, here's just kind of a list of some of the things, and I'll talk about a couple of extras as we go through. So the first of your material selection is always going to be price. And I know that sounds crazy because you think, wait, but safety first? In this case, you're not going to build anything if you cannot pay for it. And, and that's kind of a fundamental truth. Um, and so this is why certain building materials, aluminum, plastics, those sorts of things, which are very cheap, uh, people build stuff out of. And you don't see nearly as much stuff. If you just look in the world around you, probably very few things that you use for a purpose, an engineered thing rather than um, an aesthetic thing, are made out of gold um, or platinum even silver, I mean, these are such expensive materials, you would never, you would never go and build something out of gold uh, for, you know, other than maybe gold plating for electrical conductivity, there, there are places where gold is used, and I'll talk about those, um, but at least for the most part, you're not gonna build out of, out of those things. Um, and, and at the end of the day, materials probably have the single greatest impact on your product price, and not necessarily in choosing the cheaper material will be cheaper. Sometimes your manufacturing is influenced by your materials. And so it's important to know how easy it is uh, to use a material, not just to buy a material. And so we'll talk about those as we go through each of the things. Like, for example, um, you know, the stainless is really a pain to work with. It's expensive to machine stainless, even though it's a magical material. Once you get it the shape you want it, it's a pain to get to be that shape. And so that's an important thing to think about and something you think about with respect to price. Weight is another really interesting one. So weight technically is a force. Um, it's the force of gravity on a thing. It's, uh, it's like, you know, you accelerate, gravity accelerates you, and Newton, so on and so forth. Um, but, but what's really important when choosing material, sele material selection when it comes to weight is really more the density of the material because um, I can get the same strength out of paper as I can out of steel if I use enough paper. The problem is that is a lot of paper. And the weight of that is going to be insane. And so you're really looking at this kind of strength to weight ratio as it's colloquially referred to. Um, and that's uh, something we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but before we get to that, I want to note that hollow objects from a design perspective are really, really incredible. Um, and this is why nature does things like bamboo, which I have shown here. You also see this in a lot of engineered places. Uh, such as bicycle frames and aircraft bodies. And the reason for this is the vast majority of the strength of a solid bulk material, you know, if I have a, a brick of, like this is a solid piece of brass, which I'll get to in the brass section, um, which is also a musical instrument section. Um, but, uh, but this is pretty strong. But if I have this hollow, I get 
you know, depending on the wall thickness, I can get upwards of 70% of the strength with, you know, 20 or, or percent of the weight or less. And so when you're designing things, I would encourage you to think hollow um, when you're designing stuff for structural purposes. Um, cool. So strength uh, is actually kind of a, a strange thing because uh, it's not strength as a word is not well defined in, in the engineering sense. Uh, we use things like rigidity, how, how much something bends, how much strain you have under a certain amount of stress, which is the amount of um, force you're applying to the thing. And so uh, what you see down here in this corner is uh, a stress strain diagram. And this is kind of a generic one. And what that is on the vertical axis is how much load you're putting into a thing. And what you're seeing here on the horizontal axis is uh, how far it deflects. And what you'll notice is, and this is true for almost all materials, interact in some way like this chart. When you apply um, a force, it begins to yield. And that's called, uh, that's like it flexing. I'll show you a, an example of this with this piece of carbon fiber. Um, so you can see it starts to bend as I load it. But it's, it's still within that yield strength, in which case it goes back to it's below its elastic limit, so it returns to its original shape. And this is true of, of basically everything. Different things have different, um, have different amounts of things. So the elastic strapping on my mask, I can deform maybe, you know, 50% or more before I start to, like, actually tear it. And I'm still within that elastic limit. After that, I can continue to bend it for a while and it won't return to its original shape. It'll still try, but it won't get all the way there. At some point, I'm going to get to the ultimate strength. Um, in this case, it's talking about tension, and so you can see in the diagrams here that I'm pulling a thing, and that's usually done in one of these machines. These are usually called Instron, which is a brand name, but it's a strength tester, it's a tensile strength tester. And it pulls and measures how much force it's applying and then looks at this displacement and gives you this curve. Um, and so what will happen is in a metal, you'll start with this thing called necking. And, and you've probably like observed this in things like Play-Doh. As you start to deform it, it starts to, to draw out and get really skinny. And then um, it'll start to get cracks in it. And then it'll finally, it'll finally fail over here well past the ultimate tensile strength. And that's your material is gone. It's shattered. It's whatever it is. It's, it's failed. And that's um, that's not a good thing. Anyway, this is an important background when you think about a material strength, is how much of that is it needs to be resilient back to its original form, and how much of that is I need this thing to not fail when I like hop onto a swing set. Um, but if it bends a little bit, I don't care much if it bends back or not. And the swing set, eh, maybe you do want it to bend back. Uh, maybe a poor example. Durability is kind of closely tied with strength. Um, though it is distinct, uh, durability is really about repeated wear. Um, and this can happen in a variety of different ways. Um, what you can see down here is what's called a, um, uh, a living hinge. And those are things you see on the top of bottle caps all the time. And that's uh, molded in a single piece, but eventually that thing's probably going to wear out. And so you choose your material based on that flexibility so that you can use it um, to do that. This picture here you see is what's called galling, and that's what happens when you have two pieces moving with respect to each other in a repeated fashion. So this can happen on the inside of bearings, as shown here. Talking more about that in week five. Um, but this is where the material starts to bind on itself, and it, and it starts to create these streaks. So you can see the, the rotational direction here on that, and that's what happens. This is a really extreme case of it, but that's what happens when your bearings run without oil, and it makes every mechanical engineer's uh, heart drop when you hear the sound of a galled component rolling around in somewhere. It's, it's horrific. Um, but you're thinking about durability, durability with respect to repeated use. So if you're designing something as a prototype, maybe you, maybe you 3D print it, and your durability is not that big a deal because you're going to use it once, twice, three times, and then chuck it. But if you want to use something forever, maybe you need to think about a bigger and better material. Corrosion is another really important thing. I'm going to talk about this a bunch in the metals section, but it does apply potentially to other materials um, in some kind of edge cases. For example, uh, if you have ceramics in an extremely reactive plasma, it can corrode. I know this because I've done it. Um, and uh, so this is something to kind of pay attention to. A broad thing, most materials that aren't metal, this is less of a concern, so we won't touch on that so much. <clears throat> 
heat and thermal effects are a big and important part of your material selection. I'm showing a cast iron pan here. Don't worry, the same picture comes up later. Um, and uh, that's because cast iron is really interesting in a lot of ways. Um, it is an excellent thermal conductor, but it also has a high specific heat capacity. And what that means is you can store a lot of heat in it. And the reason you get a great steak out of a cast iron, which you don't get out of an aluminum pan, is uh, the aluminum has also very high thermal conductivity, but it doesn't hold as much heat. And so when you flop that steak onto your, uh, onto your, ca onto your cast iron, it really cooks that bottom really fast, and that seals in the juices, and you get a much better steak out of it. I like steak. Um, so um, different materials have kind of thermal conductivity is the property, and I, I put two bullet points here, one as a thermal insulator and one as a thermal conductor, and, and that is the same property. That is thermal conductivity um, explained through kind of two different lenses. If I want something to keep me warm, if it's a jacket or something, I want something that is a thermal insulator. That means it has low thermal conductivity. If I want something to be a heat sink, uh, then I would really like to have high thermal conductivity. And this is important to think about in a variety of different contexts. Thermal expansion and dimensional change is another important part of it. And that kind of is a lead up into melting points. So um, most materials expand when heated. Um, this is, there is a degree to which thermal expansion happens. And so for example, like aluminum expands more thermally than steel does by a lot. Um, and actually uh, one of my favorite YouTubers, Mark Rober has built a ice cream safe based on this principle that at room temperature, they just barely fit together. But when you freeze this thing, uh, the aluminum lid shrinks a lot more onto the steel contraption and it's just completely unopenable, but you run it under uh, warm water, the lid expands again, you can take this thing apart. Just some brilliant engineering. It's so simple and so elegant. Um, and so you should, you should expect that sort of uh, dimensional change. Um, and if you're designing for something that's gonna be operating over a wide variety of temperatures, think about that as you're designing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, tiny bit more about that in the thermal section in week four. Uh, melting point is an important part of your material. Um, clearly, if you are looking for something that needs to get very hot, if you make it out of um, low temperature plastics uh, or lead, you're going to end up with your material running away from you. And so melting point is an, uh, an important one to think about because it, it influences your design, but also that's true uh, with the flow temperature in thermoplastics. More on that in plastics. I know I'm saying more on that in, that's because we are going to cover a lot. Okay, cool. Um, workability is a massive and important thing. And this probably ought to be up there with price in terms of the importance of this. When you are making stuff, it's important that you can make stuff from your stuff. Um, and that you should think about how you're going to build it with your material selection. And those things go hand in hand. I did materials first before manufacturing because uh, we're going to talk a lot about materials next week. And I want you to have the basis for it. But honestly, these, these are, are, are twins in the world of design. Um, and so you need to think about your design. How are you going to build this? OK, what am I going to build it out of? And, uh, and so if I'm going to be machining something, how machinable is my material? In this, in this particular case, you know, maybe a different grade of aluminum is more machinable. And so I choose that. That's certainly true with steels. Um, and uh, weldability is also important. If I'm going to be making a big structure and I'm going to have to weld it, um, then I need to make sure I'm choosing weldable material. Formable is um, kind of a word. There's not a great definition for this, but the idea of formable is can I like press it until it assumes the shape that I want it to be? Uh, whereas I would distinguish that from moldable in that moldable materials uh, are ones where you would pour parts into pour something liquid into a mold, and then it would become a shape that would harden after that. Um, I'll talk about that also later on. Ooh, I skipped one. Yeah, OK. Um, electrical uh, is an important material component uh, for your mechanical engineering. Um, you can choose materials that are electrically conductive or electrically insulating. Again, like uh, thermal considerations, that's all on a continuum of electrical conductivity, which is a material property you can look up. Insulating is low electrical conductivity, and conductive is high conductivity, same as thermal. Uh, 
Um, and actually, the picture I've got here is one of aluminum wiring, which is used in uh, low-cost applications because aluminum is much cheaper uh, than copper. Unfortunately, it's not as conductive, and so you end up with heating and fires and that sort of stuff if you don't use enough of it or you have to use more of it. And one of the things I find when I'm in Berlin is that I, I one of my recreational hobbies is to go and trespass on abandoned buildings. And um, you find a lot of the old uh, East German construction used aluminum wiring. And so they've cut through these huge, you know, big pipes of, of electrical things for, you know, blast furnaces and chemical plants and all of these cool places. And these big aluminum wires in there. And I'm, I just look at them and I'm like, oh, this is, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Though, in fairness, the fall of communism was the disaster that actually happened. Um, so um, also electrical components tend to have magnetic properties as well. Um, when you're using ferro, ferrous um, metals, which we'll talk about in a second, they tend to be magnetic as well. So think about that. If you have a magnetic application, putting something near a motor, uh, if you need to, to, to have something that's non-magnetic, you, uh, you can choose those things. Um, and that's also true if you're thinking about static discharge. So if you have sensitive electronic components, you may want to think about whether or not you want to use a metal nearby. This is an important, an important thing. Um, cool. Let's move along. Uh, now we're looking at chemical compatibility. And this is more important if you intend to be using your materials um, in conjunction with your liquids and gases. So what I've got up here is a chart of solvent compatibility. And this is a very standard thing that you look at when you're building something that's going to go into, say, a laboratory application. If you're doing your own uh, like home uh, biology stuff, when you're making your own reaction vessels, this is an extremely important thing to think about. Um, and so what you're looking at here is your materials on the top and then what dissolves them basically over here on the left. And uh, what you'll notice is PTFE, which is commonly referred to as Teflon, polytetrafluoroethylene. We'll talk, it's got a whole slide. Um, over here has excellent... Uh, has excellent resistance to most things, except for benzene, which is a terrifying solvent. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of look across like, hey, if I'm going to be using this with uh, ethyl alcohol, which is common drinking alcohol, ethanol, um, then I can use uh, ABS plastic or high density polyethylene, no problem. Um, and so I would go and kind of look at these things before I ma manufacture something. So I've built a handful of cocktail robots because they're super fun. And so I come in here and I look at my ethyl alcohol um, and water as those. Most of these are, these are not water soluble, so I don't have to worry about that. But that's something that I would think about uh, in my design thing. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about some other things. Safety, uh, this is a picture from one of those recreational trespassing exhibits. You might notice there is a hanging lump of asbestos. Um, that stuff is uh, highly carcinogenic when it's blowing around in the breeze as it was. Um, and uh, I think that's something to think about when you're designing is well, whether or not my materials are safe. Um, I think also, as you're thinking about materials, there's another uh, direction you can go, which is past just safety is what's called biocompatibility. And I would differentiate those. Safety is if I interact, or interact with it in the environment, something like asbestos is unsafe, lead not too, too safe in most cases. So you can work with it anyway, and I have. Biocompatibility, I would differentiate as I would let someone implant this in my body, and I would be okay with it sitting under my skin for a while. And there are biocompatible materials that make implants out of stuff all the time. Gold, for instance, is a phenomenally biocompatible material. Unfortunately, uh, it's expensive. Optical properties are also important. If you need something that you're going to look out the front of a windshield for, it's best if it's not opaque. Um, and so uh, that's an important one to think about. If you're building something that has to be aesthetically pleasing, uh, which I'm not good at, um, but many people are, uh, that's an important thing. So you may choose something that holds paint well or something like that. Uh, flammability is an important thing if you have any worries about that. Again, that's, uh, that's context specific. And uh, also hydrophobicity. So that is the tendency of water to beat up on the surface of a thing. Something like paper, if you drop a drop of water on it, it's going to soak right in. Uh, something like Teflon, if you drop a bead of water on it, it's going to stay as a bead on top. And that's important for a variety of reasons. Um, in context, you might want, it makes things easier to clean if you're using foods. Um, so that's why typically you choose like PVC tubing for foods, um, because PVC is pretty hydrophobic, it's pretty cheap, um, and you can pipe around your alcohol in it just fine. Um, there's 
a whole variety of other, other stuff um, that you may run into as you're designing. And think of these as, um, as important in your material selections. Um, so cool. That is all of our material selection criteria. Cool, we've crossed one of them off. How are we doing on time? Oh, <laughs> I should move faster. Um, cool. Um, so now we're going to get into metals. I'm going to go through and cover metals one by one. Um, this is on the quiz later. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to make a joke about it. this is heavy metal and many of my favorite artists. What is metal? Metal uh, are these blocks in yellow over here. Also, if you guys have questions, plop them up in chat um, as we're going. And then during the q and I'll go and, and look at all of them. I don't have my headphones on and I'm not reading chat. So I want to answer them till the end anyway. Um, so anyway, back to what we were working on right here. These things are all considered metals under here. Everything that's in that kind of yellowish color. And they tend to share some things in, in common, tend to be electrically and thermally conductive. Uh, ductile, meaning you can draw them and they stretch like we saw in the strength thing. Malleable, meaning you can pound them and work them. And sectile, meaning you can shave them with a sharp implement. And this is important in the way that you fabricate metals. All three of those things come into play. If you want wire, it's important that it's ductile. Uh, if you want to forge something, malleability matters. And sectility matters in the world of machining, uh, which is week three. Um, alloyable is uh, typical. Um, and that's true whether you're looking at kind of a aesthetic noble metal, such as gold, platinum being al alloyed, or gold and silver um, to make white gold, or whether you need a high strength something or other like stainless steel, which I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, we'll talk about how you fabricate metals uh, next week. And so I'm going to make uh, references to some of those things and some of those fabrication methods. And just know that that's not happening this time, but we'll talk about that next week, how, how those things kind of all matter together. Metal uh, is created in grains, and this is an important part. You've actually kind of probably witnessed this if you've looked at um, parts. I don't know if my galvanized steel thing here has grains. I can see them, but I don't think my camera will pick them up, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, you can kind of see these pictures here. And these grains are interesting. So the way that those work is those are a single crystal of metal when you look at a grain. And they interact with each other in different ways. So most metals are... Um, pretty close to polycrystalline, meaning you have these grains, and then where the boundaries are, they have these kind of metal atoms that don't quite meet up, and you get these, these dislocations, and those travel through. And actually, that's a good thing. Um, you want that to be there like that. They have a significant impact on the material properties of your metal. If you have a single monocrystalline thing, it is, has a very a much higher um, yield strength, but it doesn't have as good elastic properties, so it won't Go back to where it is. Uh, wait, I may have messed that up. Um, but it changes the, 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 the tendency when it fails. Um, so, so let's see, higher stiffness, lower ultimate yield strength. That's right, for, lar for larger grains. Um, and so, but it can also reduce creep. So creep is if you have a metal being pushed for a long time, it's going to have a tendency to deflect and stay there for forever. And this is true particularly if you're designing something with springs that's going to stay in one place for a long time. Like if you're packaging a, a thing with springs in it and it's going to be going for years before someone opens it, then um, creep is something that's not ideal. You can control grain size in the way that you finish your material. So this is often done in the manufacturer um, before you get a material. So this is, this, is where a real, this is where engineers are really going to pay attention to what material they're getting from their manufacturer. And so this is true in the extrusion process when they're making stuff. Um, so you start with a big molten vat of, I don't know, say steel, and then it comes out of the molten vat um, in usually extrusions of some sort, or uh, it's poured into mold and, uh, and cast or forged or whatever. All of those things have impacts on the way that your grain size um, is, is, is the outcome of your grain size. And so you can do things to, to change it even after that. So annealing um, will increase the grain size. Work hardening is where you wham it with a thing, which is why you see blacksmiths hammering stuff. Um, and that increases the strength uh, by decreasing the grain size. So there's kind of like a perfect, um, there's kind of a perfect grain size thing. And that's this hull patch strengthening limit. And so you really want your grains to be right around the 10 nanometer uh, grain size, which is way, way, way microscopic. You'll never see that. Um, but that's just 
details you don't need. Um, metals tend to oxidize. Um, almost, almost all metals oxidize. Noble metals don't. The metals that I've shown here, um, the pink ones are noble. Um, and mm, the others are sometimes considered, depending on who you ask, as nobles. Um, and they don't, they don't interact with oxygen. But basically, every other metal does. Um, sometimes this is a really bad thing. So in the case of ferrous metals, uh, they form iron three oxide, which is commonly called rust. Um, and that's an oxide that will continue to eat through the metal. And that's a big problem with corrosion. Um, so you don't want that. Many metals have self-limiting oxides. And so this is where the metal interacts with the oxygen in the air. And so aluminum and titanium have self-limiting oxides, which is really nice. Both of them tend to be quite inert uh, once they've oxidized. Chromium and nickel also do that, and they're used as alloying agents to prevent the oxidation in other metals, which is extra cool. Um, and that's the idea behind this is that, like, for instance, in stainless steel, you have chromium, high chromium content, and the chromium forms chromium oxide on the surface of your steel, and that prevents the rust from propagating, the oxidization from propagating through your material, allowing you to have this uh, really nice stain rust free material. You can still have corrosion of some types um, with, uh, with your metals, and, and that's true even with stainless steels and things that have oxide-limiting things. And that's uh, one I want to talk about briefly, which is galvanic corrosion. And this is where you have uh, dissimilar electric potentials among materials, as shown on this chart. So you can see electric potentials on this chart. Um, so like magnesium is extremely anodic, uh, while, say, gold is extremely cathodic. Um, and so when you put those things in electrical contact in a water-based solution, what will happen is um, electricity will flow from one to the other, and that causes uh, corrosion on one, and it would cause deposition on the other, except oftentimes this is a, a moving system, so like a piping system. And this is something um, that I have had happen in situations of my own. I made a cooling system uh, that, that circulated liquid through uh, pumps, and uh, I had my, my steel pump connected to a brass fitting. And this circulation loop ran for three years. And uh, when we opened up the liquid tank inside of it, because it was a closed system, it was all sealed, there was no evaporation, we opened up the tank inside of it, and we looked in it, and it was just like rust juice. Um, it was just gross. And it was because we had corroded these parts on the inside, and we took everything apart. I mean, it was a miracle we didn't break any of these parts because they were just corroded like crazy and any of these pieces in on its own would not have corroded in that environment but because of this galvanic corrosion they were they were doing that so i learned that one the hard way um, hydrogen embrittlement we talked about a little bit in the very very beginning this happens when hydrogen gets into your material into your metal and a high hydrogen content uh, reduces the strength of things i'm not going to talk too much about this you can bake your product to get it out of there unless you're doing something like a bridge uh, or an aerospace application, probably this you're not going to worry too much about this because you'll design it in such a way that you can uh, use a little bit stronger material than you need, and probably you're not within the, the limits where you're not so close to your margin of safety that this is going to be a, a scary thing. All right, uh, talking about um, specific materials, I'm going to break metals into two different groups. There are metals that are ferrous, that means iron-containing, and metals that are non-ferrous, which is everything else. Um, so we'll start out with ferrous. Uh, the classic one of these is what, what started the Iron Age, which is cast iron. Uh, you can also uh, wrought iron, which is where you bend it from a shape. Um, cast iron is really nice for a lot of reasons. A, it has that really, really high specific heat, which makes it great for cooking. Um, it's porous, which means you can seep all those nice steak juices in and then things don't stick. Um, and it is also, in an industrial sense, it's vibration absorbing, which means you can use it and make bearings out of it uh, in places where you have acoustically uh, important things. You can do, if you need something to be hard and also acoustically dampening, uh, cast iron is a good one for that, which is kind of a strange one. So um, steel is a much more common ferrous material. So you can see what I've done is I've added a tiny little bit of uh, carbon in there up to about a percent and a half, which radically increases the strength of my iron. Um, and so low carbon steel tends to be much easier to machine and to weld. High carbon steel is just a pain to work with, though it is really strong. Um, and so you tend to use that for your tools when you're making 
uh, when you're making things. Uh, there are a huge variety of steels. Um, and plain steel rusts regardless of carbon content, so you may want um, to you may want to to galvanize or paint paint it. Galvanizing is where you dip it in hot zinc typically, or you electrocoat it, electroplate it in zinc. Painting it is painting it. And powder coating is where you take a dry paint and you create an electrostatic charge and then the powder sticks to it and then you melt it and it like forms into this beautiful coating. And most of the things you see are uh, out there that are coated are uh, powder coated. I'm looking for an example around like uh, this right here is some powder coated metal. So, you know, it's this blue color, but it's originally a steel piece that's been bent. Um, the uh, steel is typically referred to by number. Um, and so uh, carbon steels with no other alloying components are usually four digits long, beginning with a one. You can look in charts online. All of this is typically um, uh, typically uh, found uh, in ISO 4949 or in SAE, which is the original standard, uh, let's see, Society for Automotive Engineers, I think, but now it's SAE International, so it's an international standards organization. And most of the planet still uses the SAE standard, which is an American one, uh, though you can also find ISO as well. Um, but if I say a 1018 steel, um, that's a fairly standard weldable steel that looks like this. It's got that nice kind of grayish steel color to it. And you can see this one's been uh, drilled out and I've actually welded another piece of this exact bar um, a different thing. Um, here is a picture. This is what galvanized steel looks like. It's often quite shiny. Sometimes you can really see, you can kind of see the grain structure in there. Galvanic coating tends to have a really distinct grain pattern to it. And that prevents rusting, uh, but also please do not weld galvanized uh, material because the zinc comes off as zinc oxide gets in your lungs and is not good for you. Um, cool. That's everything about steel that you ever wanted to know. Let's talk about stainless steel. Um, Oh, yes, I'm seeing in chat. Uh, there are two Will Fishers. One is my audio, and the other is my video. Um, I get better audio off my phone. Sorry. <laughs> um, stainless steel is, a, is, a, um, is a, an alloy of steel. So you're starting with your iron and your carbon, and you're alloying in significant portions of chromium and nickel. And chromium and nickel both form those self-limiting oxides, uh, which allow you uh, to prevent your your steel from rusting, um, so I've got this. Oops, shoot, I've got this piece here. This is kind of what a stainless steel would look like. You'll notice it's not rusting. This is an old, this is a high capacity load cell for measuring weight. Um, and sometimes you also find it like uh, these kind of nice rods of stainless. It can be polished up to be very nice, um, and is wonderful stuff. Um, so there are a huge variety of stainlesses. Um, they come in numberings. They tend to be three-digit long numbers. 300 is all austenitic, and 400 series is all martensitic. Um, and austenitic ones tend to be non-magnetic, which is uncommon uh, for iron compound, iron-containing compounds. But uh, the for whatever reason, the alloying materials mean that you have non-magnetic, which is actually really nice because you have a high-strength non-magnetic material that doesn't rust. It's nice stuff. It's a pain in the butt to machine because it work hardens with heat. And so if you, and it's quite, it's quite hard. And so if you put uh, anything but the sharpest bit into it, um, what happens is the friction quickly heats the material. Um, oxygen comes in from the heat and it work hardens, leaving you with just a piece of stainless steel slag and a real, real, real dull bit. So it's one of the bigger pains to machine. And most machine shops will be like, all right, really? Okay, fine when you ask them to machine stainless. It's also relatively difficult to weld because the materials uh, relative to stainless to normal steel, it's difficult to weld because the chromium and uh, nickel at high temperatures will start to react with oxygen um, and you're getting further into the material and it stays reactive while it's molten. So you have to weld it under a shielded argon, which is standard for TIG. Again, next week. Uh, it has the same ISO and SAE number for the um, numbering. Now we'll talk about non-ferrous metals. Yeah, that was all of the ferrous metals in however many minutes. And that's everything that's not iron-based. I'm going to talk about basically nothing over there on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, on the left-hand side of the periodic table, with the exception of magnesium, uh, which is over here by sodium. 
Um, but the rest of these materials are not useful mostly in an engineering application. If you come to machine something out of uranium, you are a better engineer than I am. Um, and you don't need to be watching this. Um, and so we're going to skip those for the most part. Uh, we're going to take an in-depth look at um, aluminum, uh, copper alloys, and titanium, and then we're going to go through a couple other ones really fast. Aluminum is magnificent. Aluminum is great. It's cheap, which is awesome. Uh, it's easy to machine. It's a little bit harder than steel to weld. It's kind of like stainless steel to weld, except that it has very high thermal conductivity. So as you weld it, it start and it starts to melt, it all melts and it runs away from you very quickly. Um, but if you decide you want to weld stuff out of aluminum, I am I very much encourage this. You can buy a TIG welder these days for like 400, 500 bucks. Um, it plasma cuts super easily. You can buy a plasma cutter for 150 bucks if your TIG doesn't come with it. Buy yourself a tank of argon, get out there to the garage and start putting together stuff. You're going to wreck a lot of aluminum first, but gosh, once you can do it, you feel like a, just a magician. It's awesome. Um, it has very high thermal conductivity, some of the highest out there, um, especially for a cheap material. That's why you see heat sinks and stuff made out of it all the time. Um, and it has very high electrical conductivity, which is why they make wiring out of it. And it's a lot cheaper than copper. Um, it comes in extrusions that look kind of like this. This is one off my whiteboard. You can see this is a long shape that's the same thing, and that means they pushed it through a die while it's still molten. Um, and then you get this long sheet, and then they just chop it. And they make these things like this. And so it's extremely light. You can see that this is thin, but it's extremely rigid. Like, I cannot, I'm, I'm not, not bending it much at all. Um, and uh, yeah, and this weighs like nothing, you know. Um, so this is why it's used commonly in aerospace, um, because it's also spotlighted my, yes. Uh, no, I'm not unmuting. Later. Uh, I'm already unmuted. Perfect. Okay. Glad people could see me. Sorry. Sorry. That was, yeah. Hope you haven't missed all of it. Um, and hopefully you can still see the, uh, the screen share. Um, so aluminum also has this really nice self-limiting oxide, which means you plop it outside. I have, I have one out in front, and it's great. You can leave it outside forever. It's great. Um, the grading system is, of course, uh, different, uh, different from steel, um, because it would be too easy if all of these had the same grading system. Um, but the ones you're going to see out there in the real world, in the wild, you're going to see a lot of 6061. This is a very common alloy. Um, and it's extremely easy to machine. It cuts beautifully um, and, um, and it has good dimensional accuracy. It's not terribly expensive. Uh, 6061T6 refers to uh, the tempering grade, how it's been post-treated after the alloy. Um, and that one's particularly good for machining. And there's even a designer brand name one called Mike 6, which they've done something extra special to. And it is even easier to machine. So if you want to machine beautiful parts, uh, 6061 T6 or Mike 6, both magnificent parts come out. Um, here's a, an aluminum part that I machined in the mill. Um, and so you can see this was actually done on a five axis machine. I didn't do a particularly good job of it because I just wanted it done quick, but um, it's a pretty good way to go for that. 7075 is the one you often hear referred to as aircraft aluminum. Um, it's extremely high strength. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to machine and it's quite, quite a lot more expensive. Uh, but if you really want something, if you want to brag to your buddies, like I made something out of aircraft aluminum, that's the stuff. Um, that's, that's the, 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 the bragging material right there. Uh, what's going on? Okay. Copper alloys, uh, copper alloys. Generally, if you're working with pure copper, it is a real pain to, to manufacture stuff out of. It's great because it has basically the highest th electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity of any workable material. Like gold is officially higher, but it's so expensive, you'd never use it to build a thing. So you have to use copper for those sorts of, so, sorts of situations, but it's kind of a pain um, to actually manufacture with it. It does oxidize, it patinas with kind of a green color, which they use a lot of times in architectural world because it's really quite attractive. Um, but what happens when machining it is that it has very high thermal expansion. And so as you get it hot from machining, it expands. And then as soon as you stop moving your drill bit, it contracts, it traps your drill bit, and you snap your drill. Um, and this is just the number of times I have junked drill bits trying to drill through copper, which is a soft material, but it's a pain in the butt. Brass, on the other hand, is extremely easy to machine. It's dimensionally stable. It's even easier to machine than aluminum. 
um, which is why whenever you see someone demonstrating their machining product, they always show it on brass because they can move it really fast without coolant. Um, and it's just like awesome. It, and you can't choose a material better to cut. It has extremely good dimensional stability. So if you just need something that fits, make it out of brass. It's great. Um, it does have pretty high thermal expansion. So if it needs to be uh, over a, a broad, both aluminum and brass have high thermal expansion. So if you're using it over a variety of temperatures, you may want to choose a different material. Um, but you can see here, like this is a gear uh, from a worm drive uh, made out of brass and they just machined it and it's just gorgeous. And it fits with this corresponding uh, steel one tightly and beautifully. Um, Bronze is another really great material. Um, it's used oftentimes in bearings. It has a slight porosity to it, and so they, they will backfill the, the porosity of it with oil, and then it's considered self-lubricating, and that means that you can use, uh, use it for the life of a, a bearing um, kind of indefinitely. So bronze and brass are both copper alloys, uh, brass with zinc and bronze with tin. Titanium is another really great one. I'm sorry I don't have a chunk of titanium around to show you. I've used it in my career a whole lot. It's more expensive than steel or aluminum, but it has a very high strength to weight ratio. It's used in a lot of applications. Um, it's a pain in the butt to machine because it's kind of gummy and it sticks and clogs in your tooling, um, which is a real pain. And cl chip clearance is, is, is something I'll talk about next week, but it's, it's tough for that. It's also difficult to weld because it tends to react with oxygen. Um, though once it does, it forms this very inert uh, oxide, which is why it is so biocompatible. So if you're building an implant, uh, titanium is a great material there. It's cheaper than other biocompatible material metals like platinum and gold. Um, it has lower thermal and electrical conductivity than kind of your average metal um, for whatever reason. Um, it's commonly alloyed with aluminum and vanadium. Um, it also has its own numbering system, which I'm not going to get into, that is also completely different because, of course, it is. Um, here's a couple of other materials that you may come across. Gold uh, is very pretty and precious. Um, it's also soft and it has extremely high thermal and electrical conductivity. Top of the top of the metal kingdom on that one, uh, which is why you see it in high-end uh, audio equipment all the time um, and in circuitry. Magnesium is extremely light um, and pretty rigid for its weight. Um, you see people making engine blocks out of it occasionally, which I always kind of like, mm -hmm, because it's flammable. Um, and magnesium, once lit, is not really feasible to extinguish. Um, and so, and it burns extremely hot. So if you don't oil your engine, your magnesium engine, and friction causes it to light up, it's going to burn through the bottom of your car and through the pavement as well. Um, this is something that magnesium does that's kind of exciting. Uh, so just be careful. If you find a machinist that does, magnesi that does magnesium machining, A, they are a highly qualified professional, and you should respect that person because if they have all of their digits, they are really, really good at what they're doing, or they've never done it before. Um, Tungsten is a material you see a lot in the welding world because it has the highest melting point of any single material. There are some alloys that have higher melting points, but not really workable. Um, it's, and it's used in welding equipment all the time. Um, it's extremely difficult to form in machine, um, but it can form extremely hard uh, surfaces um, in carving. And so it's often coated onto things for tooling to carve other hard materials. So tungsten carbide is a uh, commonly used coating for uh, cutting stainless steel and cutting other steel pieces. Lead, on the other hand, is an extremely low melting point, which is great because uh, you can uh, melt it with a blowtorch and form it into whatever you want. So if you would just want a piece of metal that's been cast, you could do it with lead. Uh, it's toxic, so uh, be careful. Don't breathe the fumes. You heard it here first. Um, but it's high density, so if you need something just to be heavy and you need to form it into a specific shape, lead is actually a pretty good material. I've used it before. I like it. Uh, and there's a handful of super alloys. They come in names like Inconel and Nitinol. Um, nitinol is a nice one because it's biocompatible. Um, it's a nickel titanium alloy, I think. Um, and it is used in springs a lot. Um, if you cut it, be careful because it's extremely sharp and it'll whip around and take you out. Inconel is one that's used in the drilling industries a lot um, because it's extremely hard, which makes it very difficult to form. That's all the metals. How are we doing on time? Oh, shoot. I need to be faster. All right, plastics, let's move. Um, cool, uh, plastics and polymers. Uh, polymers and plastics, I'm gonna use those names interchangeably. They are long strings of things. It's repeated molecules covalently bonded to each other. So what you see here is a repeating structure in the parentheses, and that repeats to the one next to it through this little line. So if you imagine those H's and C's next to each other, they all line up. 
in a row. They make really long ones. Those things squiggle together like this. Then maybe they branch some uh, or they branch together a whole lot and they're highly cross-linked. Um, that's typical in thermosets. This is typical in elastomers. Um, and uh, yeah, so what I mean by those things, um, elastomers are things that, that, that stretch. Silicone, rubber, um, uh, we'll talk more of those, um, nitrile, uh, which are examples of all of these things we'll get to. Um, those are all elastomers. Thermosets are things that cure at higher temperatures, so they set at the thermal. Uh, thermoplastics are things that become amorphous at temperatures, so those melt at temperatures. Um, and I'll talk through those each one by one. Uh, we're going to try and cover all of those plastics. Let's get moving. Um, so one of the most common ones out there, in fact, the most common by manufacturing volume, is polyethylene. Polyethylene is the simplest one from a chemical standpoint. It's this backbone of carbons with a bunch of hydrogens. Uh, we're going to move from simplest plastics to more complex, so strap yourselves in with plastics, presumably. Um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's typically thermoplastic. It's chemically extremely simple. Uh, that makes it extremely cheap to manufacture, and it's great for a lot of things. You see it all over the place in uh, injection molded parts, uh, like these uh, jugs down here. Uh, those actually may be blow molded, or um, uh, plastic bags, those sorts of things. You see it extruded. It's used everywhere you're going to find it out in the world it's recycled under the number one uh, and so whenever you see the recycling number and it says one on it uh it's it's there um it has high impact strength which is nice cool uh acetyl is another nice one uh, this one is possibly the easiest material to machine ever it's even easier to machine than uh metals and that's why you see people making gears and stuff out of it so you can see it's chemically a slightly more uh more complicated than uh uh than your um polyethylene, and that's because it's got that oxygen in there. But it just alternates carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen. It's cheap also. It's very good rigidity um, and excellent dimensional stability and low friction, so it's great in moving parts. I use it all the time, and I love it. It's great stuff. Uh, polypropylene, we're getting a little more complicated here. Now your backbone of carbons has another carbon sticking up off of it. Um, wherever you see a bend, that's a carbon that they just didn't bother putting in there. Um, it's a nice flexible one. It's used a lot of times in these living hinges, uh, like you see here on the Tic Tac container. Um, and uh, it's uh, also relatively inexpensive. Um, it tends to be nice and chemical and corrosion resistant um, and fatigue resistant, which is really important when you're making parts that are going to move back and forth a whole bunch. Nylon is another super common one. You see that all the time. It's your zip tie material. It's extremely high tensile strength, um, extremely uncomfortable for... Uh, tights um, and extremely good for ropes. So you see it all over the place. It's another thermoplastic, cheap, common, and it's also used in composites a fair bit because of that high tensile strength. Polycarbonate is one you see around you also all the time. It's clear um, and it's extremely resilient um, and impact resistant. So here's my water bottle. I can punch it and not worry about shattering it. That's got a really nice sound to it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a really nice one. You see also in places where high impact is potential, so like a motorcycle helmet, you don't want to shatter um, when it gets impacted from a piece of gravel, and so those are often made of uh, polycarbonate. And you can see now we're getting into a much more complicated uh, chemical structure. These are rings of carbons with some extra carbons and stuff sticking off and some oxygen from there. Cool, let's keep rolling. Um, acrylic is another one that's cl optically clear. This is oftentimes used because it is slightly more clear um, than polycarbonate. Um, you can dye it all sorts of fun colors. It's one that is absolutely magnificent to laser cut. Um, it cuts beautifully, very, um, very dimensionally, and you can cut thick pieces of it really quick. Um, it's much more brittle than polycarbonate, and so it's not as impact resistant as a result. Um, you can machine it and then go back and vapor polish it, which is where you have heated acetone underneath it, which lightly dissolves it, um, and then it will cause itself to heal up uh, and become clear again, which is super cool. If you uh, ever want a fun YouTube hole, go watch vapor polishing. It's magic. Um, but in uh, machining, be uh, careful because it is also brittle. Um, cool. Other common plastics that you see out there in the world, uh, polystyrene is used a lot in food packaging and foam peanuts. A polyurethane is often foams. Um, in fact, a lot of the memory foam mattresses are made of blends of polyurethane. Um, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, is used in plumbing and rigid applications a lot. It's nice because it's low friction also, which is great. And acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, which is a mouthful, abbreviated often as ABS, is used in 
Legos, ah, my favorite thing in the universe. Also cases and impact and strength. You find these oftentimes in plastic phone cases and that sort of stuff. Let's look at some of your more expensive plastics. Uh, Teflon, which is polytetrafluoroethylene, you can see looks a lot like polyethylene, but they've put fluorines on the end here. And the wonderful thing about fluorines and carbons is that that bond is one of the strongest in nature, um, meaning that it's very difficult to uh, pull apart. That makes it extremely inert, which is great. Um, and so you can use this in extremely crazy chemicals, um, things like hydrofluoric acid you do in Teflon, solid Teflon beakers, which is terrifying, but I've also done that one. Um, it is machinable, but when you clamp it, it deforms. So when you machine a hole and you let it go, it becomes an ellipse, uh, which is not ideal. Um, it's very expensive. I once machined a block of it that was about this size. We paid $270 for the block um, of raw material. Which is like super expensive stuff, but it's low friction, which is great, and it's extremely hydrophobic, which is awesome for cooking and cleaning afterwards because you can just like wipe it right on out. Also, because it's this fluorine uh, carbon bond, it's extremely biocompatible. So, whenever you see those people who have like crazy implants, uh, like to make horns into their skin and that sort of stuff, don't it, Google image search that if you're weak apart. Um, they're typically Teflon things that are inserted under the surface of their skin. Peak is another great um, bio one, biocompatible material. It's also extremely expensive, polyether ether ketone. You can see they've got those nice little uh, ether ketones right there um, bonded to each other. Um, it's a high temperature thermoplastic as is Teflon. So those melt at much higher temperatures, which means they can use in thermal applications. This is possibly uh, as machinable as acetyl. Um, and that's really nice because you can get these dimensionally stable things for bio applications. Um, it's also extremely chemically inert um, because of those nice ring structures. Yeah. Epoxies are another really nice one. Uh, I've got your example right here. Oftentimes you see this as adhesives um, and they're really nice, but they can also be used for self-leveling flooring. Um, they're also used oftentimes as a binder um, for composites. Uh, that's a thermoset. We finally made our way all the way through all the thermoplastics to thermosets. That means you mix two parts of it together, you mix them, and then it cures and becomes hard. The same is true for most elastomers. They tend to be thermosets also. Um, in that case, it's called vulcanizing because it comes from the rubber world, which is a natural uh, elastomer. Um, they are bendy, stretchy, and rubbery. You can make all sorts of wiggly, wiggly things out of them. Um, and they are measured typically in durometers. So this pourable silicone is a 22A durometer. Um, there's my two parts of it. Whereas this, which is the foot to my thing, uh, is like a 50 or 60 durometer thing and that is kind of how rubbery it is that's how much it deflects when uh done and it's uh that kind of rubberiness as a capacity lower is rubbery or higher is more stiff silicone is a material that's used out there all the time it's a synthetic rubber um it's like uh like your polypropylene except using silicons instead of carbons uh, it, the nice thing about it is it's extremely food safe. It has a very high melting uh, because, uh, melting point, uh, like thermal problems. So you can use it when cooking. And it's got that kind of like wobbliness to it for things like spatulas. Uh, it's also got really good chemical resistance. Um, and it's biocompatible, which is great. Uh, you see it all the time in uh, things like uh, ports and that sort of stuff. Uh, you can buy it off the shelf as room temperature vulcanization RTV, which is what this stuff is. And then you can pour it into molds or mold make with it to do that. Um, cool. Sorry, I'm moving super fast. Nitrile is another one. You can see the chemical formula up there. It's a little bit crazy. Uh, you find it most commonly in things like gloves, uh, which is nice. It's very chemically resistant, also resistant to fuel and oil. Sometimes you see it called Buna or Buna N in the case of gaskets. Um, and it can be self-healing, which is really nice if you're using a fuel application and you don't want your fuel to dissolve your, your thing. Um, cool. Sorry, I'm moving so fast. I'm seeing some of the chat come up there. Uh, you have natural rubber, which is also an elastomer. It's cheap and has excellent, excellent rubberiness because um, it's rubber. Viton is another one that's a fluoroelastomer, and that one's extremely chemical resistant, um, but expensive. So you can use that in sealing applications when you're piping around terrifying and dangerous chemicals. There's a picture of rubber being taken out of the tree because it's a natural thing. It's from the sap. All right, I have uh, literally uh, very fast go through of ceramics. Uh, the, the one slide, which is kind of a lie, um, so typical engineering ceramics are alumina and silica. That means aluminum oxide and silicon oxide. Um, 
And those are difficult to fabricate. You usually have to grind them to fabricate them. Um, they can be ground and polished. They have extremely good chemical resistance. Um, they tend to be very good thermal insulators and electrical insulators, um, but they're high density and they're brittle. So they tend to crack and break as you would think of kind of commonly when you think of ceramics. Another thing that's almost a ceramic is glass. You use this in a lot of situations. Technically, it's not a ceramic because it's an amorphous solid. That means that it has a tendency to flow, except extremely slowly, um, so you don't necessarily notice it. Um, it's extremely difficult to fabricate after molten because it has that tendency to fracture brittily. Um, most uh, glass is soda lime glass. It's silica-based, uh, which is made from melted sand, as you may know. Uh, you can also make it with uh, borosilicate, meaning you're adding bor boron in, and that makes it uh, stronger and more resilient. You can get designer glasses, uh, tempered glass, gorilla glass, uh, shatterproof glass, all those sorts of things. Also, I would love to go into more detail on that, and also I'd love to have that glass of old-fashioned. Um, now we'll touch the final bit on composites. I know I'm over time and I'm moving really fast. I'm sorry. I should have sped things up at the beginning. Um, Composites and other materials typically are a matrix and a binder. In the case of me, as shown there, I am a uh, matrix of bones with a binder of flesh. Um, and that's what keeps me from falling into an indiscreet pile. Um, some other examples of this are wood, carbon fiber, fiberglass, textiles, concrete, and paper products. Um, so we'll go through those really, really fast. Wood is a nice one because it's eco-friendly. Um, it's very cheap. Um, you can do really impressive stuff with it, like you can see some gearing in there made from wood. Uh, it always blows my mind when people make such precise things out of wood. Um, but uh, it's very easy to cut. It's much more difficult to injection mold wood. Um, in fact, I don't know if it can be done. And the strength varies greatly on species, grain direction, and that sort of stuff. So sometimes you have something that's extremely strong with grain, but very weak against grain. Um, and the differences are, are vast between species. Um, it tends to be hydrophilic, which means it will absorb moisture um, and porous, so you should seal it before using it in contact with liquids, uh, unless you want your liquids to be in whiskey, in which case, don't seal it. Um, carbon fiber and fiberglass, just one slide on these. Again, this is an entire career in one slide. Um, it's extremely lightweight and extremely rigid. Um, I actually have some carbon, carbon fiber rod here, and you can see I can put a fair bit of thing on it. It's just bending a little bit. And this thing is like hollow and tiny and it weighs just like less than a soda straw. Um, it tends to be quite expensive for what you get uh, by, by weight. Um, and it's a real pain to form. Um, fiberglass additionally, if you're saw and stuff, like always wear uh, breathing protection when you're working around these things. Those little carbon fibers get into your lungs and they are not good for you. Uh, textiles, just want to touch briefly, they are a perfectly viable engineering material. Uh, they are fibrous things woven together. It can be natural fibers, synthetic fibers, or both. Um, they tend to be very strong in tension, except very flexible, so very difficult to build a bridge out of just tension. Um, tends to be pretty easy to cut, um, and they tend to be extremely hydrophilic because of that cross-weave. Uh, the surface tension of water will it to, cause it to soak right in. Um, Concrete is another one. This one's used a lot more in kind of the civil engineering world. You just find it occasionally in mechanical engineering. It's really nice because it's extremely high density, meaning heavy, um, and it's extremely cheap for the volume you get. Um, you can go out and buy a big, big bag of concrete, mix it up in your in your quickcrete in your in your driveway, and have a bunch of it. It's moldable, um, but difficult to fabricate after uh, you poured it and it's set. Um, tends to be pretty wear resistant, um, and you can seal it and paint it to keep water from infiltrating. Otherwise. Uh, it can be slightly hydrophilic. Paper products are really cool. Never discount these when you're prototyping. I build stuff out of cardboard all the time because it's basically free. You can find cardboard anywhere. It cuts easily with a razor blade or a knife. Um, you can make all sorts of stuff. Paper mache is another really cool material. I don't use that one quite as much, but it's nice if you need to build an aesthetic mock-up of something that's relatively big, um, and it'll hold paint. Uh, paper products tend to be really easy to laser cut and cut form. Um, and they can be shredded. You can even mold them uh, by shredding them first and applying binder into them. Uh, they tend to be quite hydrophilic. That's why you use them for napkins. Cool. There we are. I'm sorry I had to rush that last little bit. Wish I'd paced myself a little bit better, but now I know. Um, remember last week I talked about engineering being about humility, but it's also about curiosity. Um, the best of all of this stuff is to get curious from these slides and go out and teach yourself the next steps. <laughs>
So uh, thank you guys. I just, last week you guys asked for some resources to check out. I'm gonna leave these up during Q&A. It is Q&A time, um, but I'm gonna leave those up 